Sucio Talk Podcast. This is reissue episode numero dos. I'm sorry, numero tres. Number one, Tyler Vorce. Number two, Charlie Apple. Number three, Maddie Cam. All right. Common thread here is all these dudes went to Johnson & Wales University. That's where I met them all. Uh, and I'll go ahead and read the caption that I wrote for the f- first uh, drop of the Maddie Cammer episode. Chef Matt Cammer. All right, here we go. Matthew Cameron is the executive chef at the beautiful restaurant named Harbor House Inn. I met him long ago at Johnson & Wales University. Since then, he's put his head down and has worked his way up in some of the coolest restaurants in the world with some of the greatest chefs of our time. To see a young cook I met so long ago become the chef he is today is truly remarkable and a testament to his hard work and ambition. The best quality about Chef Matthew is that although he has been wildly successful during his time at Harbor House, he strongly believes that his vision has not even begun to shine as bright as it will. A special thank you to Matthew Kammer for making this happen. And then the photo was taken by Trox. So, John Troxell. Trox does a lot of photos, black and white, very dramatic um, sort of depictions of chefs. And chefs love drama, so that's why... We like him, okay? <laughs> so he's pretty cool, though. He'll reach out and be like, hey, let's see what you're doing over there. I want to take pictures. Sure. So cool-ass dude. Uh, I can't wait to have him on the show again. I recorded with him at some point uh, last year during my road trip travels. Uh, even I forget sometimes, guys. 14,000 miles in 50 days 70 restaurants 30 podcasts that all between october 10th and december 5th i think that's when i came back to to the bay um so very happy Uh, i might might seem a little repetitive from the last intro I did just because uh, I'm doing them all on the same day. I'm just trying to get these episodes out to you guys. Uh, shout out to Scotty Davis. He hit me up. He was looking for the episodes. They weren't quite up on Spotify yet. Now they are. I'm finding out that uh, when you upload the video onto the platform, it takes that much longer to then put it on Spotify. So uh, the premieres, I want them to be at 10, but just to ensure that the video is ready by 10, I'm going to drop them a little bit earlier. So if you set up the notifications for the podcast, you might be able to um, hear them a little bit earlier than 10 p.m. I'm still going to advertise 10 p.m. as the drop date uh, on Mondays, but I want to make sure that um, you guys, you know, I communicate properly what's coming out, when it's coming out, and then have that as sort of the deadline. But if you set up the notifications, you'll probably get the, the show a couple hours beforehand. So it's a little little hack for you Sucio Talk out there. Sucio Talkers. You know what I mean? I don't know what to call you guys. Sucio Mob? Sucio Listeners? I don't know. You tell me. What should I call you? Sucio Hive? Email. SucioTalk at gmail.com. Again, still working on the website. I want to have a place where clandestine food writers can put their articles. Uh, We know where all the pop-ups are. We know who the pop-up chefs are. We know where the websites are, what's going on in the Bay Area, uh, and and honestly, all the U.S. So hopefully, you know, I can get that up and running. Um, Just very slow at it because, again, I'm just kind of inept when it comes to computers. Inept. I like that vocabulary word right there. But other than that, chilling out here, learning to look at the camera, learning to not touch my face. So learning all these things, taking uh, all advice with a grain of salt, you know. So this podcast is possible because of you listening, supporting, being uh, that, those people for me. Sometimes when I get down on myself... I'll get a text message from from one of you guys telling me how much the show means to you. And, you know, honestly, the show has saved my life. I thought that I was um, stuck, 
you know, I wasn't a chef anymore. I kind of lost my identity. So regaining sort of, you know, who I am through the show and not giving a fuck about other people's opinions. I will not go through this life caring what other people think. I will only do what is right for me. And that is a mentality that I want to live on a day-to-day basis. And you can do the same. And you will see the results that come about. Sucio Talk Podcast, Episode 2. Episode 3, sorry. Still fucking that up. Sucio Talk 3. None of this episode bullshit. Um, again, Matthew Kammer, chef up at the Harbor House Inn in Elk, California. Shout out to his farmer, Amy Smith, who used to be the farmer at Meadowood. So truly talented team up there. Um, I believe Danny D'Amico is up there as well. Uh, I think he's going to be the CDC. I don't know if that news is out there, but pretty sure that that's where he's going. And truly in the United States, I think that that is the restaurant that definitely is going to get three stars uh, either, you know, next year, this year, next year. I think it. I think the guide already came out this year. I could be wrong. Uh, and that's another thing that I need to work on is like, I need to know these things. When does Michelin come out and what city, you know, uh, I, I, again, shielding myself from all this shit just so I can learn how to cook and be the best chef I can be. And I sort of, um, I squandered some time that I could have used researching shit like that. Uh, just to know it off the top of my head, because if I'm going to be this person for you guys, I want to make sure that I got all the information. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but other than that, everyone take care. Peace out. Everyone love everyone. And I will see you next time. I'm going to be wearing the same exact clothes for the next episode intro. And that's episode four, Jason McKinney. Which I already dropped the video episode with him, so why should I do a intro for that? Because he's special too, guys. Okay? Peace. Thank you very much. Welcome to the third episode of Sucio Talk. I'm sitting here with my boy, Matthew Kammerer, chef of Harbor House Inn in uh, Elk, California. Super excited to have him. I'm here in his beautiful home, which I hear is up for sale. Yeah, right, right? No, right? Something no. like that. Maybe for rent. <laughs> yeah, we got, we got bedrooms. We there, got bedrooms available. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right, so I just actually uh, ate dinner over there at Harbor House, and it was delicious. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you to the team. Thanks for making the trip. Um, you know, it's. Uh, I was telling him it was different. Uh, and then when I had said that, he looked at me like, you motherfucker, what do you mean by that? So, I t- you know, it was all positive. Um, you know, I love I loved the flavors. I loved how um everything spoke for itself and nothing was muddled uh the whole it was almost different because you know you finish with a tea it nobody really finishes with a tea here in the states everybody's a little too afraid to do that so what was the thinking behind that yeah i mean you're in elk right so you're not going out after um you know it's time to go back to your room or wherever you're at to you know call it a night and uh it's just another way to utilize the property. So everything's picked, you know, the tea gets fired and somebody runs out of the garden, picks it. Aromatics are still there. It's fresh and uh, just kind of suits the, the end of the service. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, so, you know, you're at Harbor house now, but you know, at Susio talk, we like to take it all the way from the beginning. We're going back. We're going back. So, um, you were, uh, were raised, born, born and raised where? New Jersey, New Jersey, New Jersey. What, what town? Uh, West Long Branch, so right on the shore there. Very cool. Very Pre, cool. Pre-MTV shore. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. so it was the much shore. more calm then. Yeah, yeah. Well, probably some sketch shit was happening with it. It wasn't televised. So yes, we'll just exactly, leave it at that. Yeah. Um, so, and then your parents, what do they do? Uh, dad was in the motion picture business. Mom is a jeweler. Very cool. Yeah, motion so, picture business. Yeah. like TV, talking... movies, things like Very that. Very cool. So, Producer, yeah. director, promoter? Uh, called the grip. So uh, all the lighting. All right. So not necessarily the lights, but setting up all the diffusions and things like that. So. Very cool. Very cool. And then your mom was a jeweler in town or? Yeah. So uh, worked at the same joint since she was 18 and now she owns it. So. Wow. Yeah, to this day. She's, yeah. She's pushing. There you go. She's, pushing that weight out uh, there. 
work ethic like you've never seen. So yeah, that's she's, very cool. She's a monster. Do you think, uh, you know, while, while you were growing up, did you did she have aspirations to own it? Or was it always like, I'm just going to... Nah, she needed a job. And then yeah. she just fucking... <laughs> <laughs> she's... she's it, it, that's all the best shit like, works out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like, <laughs> so, um, you know, you're young. And uh, when did you first pique your interest in cooking? Man, cooking. So I think it was without even realizing food first. Um, parents worked a lot, so I had the babysitter after school. First, second grade, I'd be calling mom up after school, like, what's for dinner? And she's like, what the fuck is this kid talking about? <laughs> like, go outside or something. But I was always like, all right, what's for dinner? So without knowing it, um, you know, food was always in the forefront, but I was never like, I'm going to be a chef at that age. Mm -hmm. And then school not for me um obviously went to johnson and wales so. oh, sure, that's that's how you know school yeah. works. you're like i picked this school i know they're gonna be you great. know um so like yeah I, I couldn't get into real college but prior to that oh, i guess i should keep going back I, I was always just interested in food so um parents divorced quite early so i would go hang out with my dad in uh north jersey and what we would do is go out to eat so okay you know that would be like our thing so by like nine ten, I was like smashing sushi, lobster, and he's just like, well, "What the fuck did I create? Like yeah. this kid is getting expensive now." I'm like, yeah, I'm the rack of lamb. I'm like, <laughs> he's like, "What the?" They're like always joking around, like, "Oh yeah, you come with the two best friends every weekend, hunger and thirst," because I'm just right. like be putting it down. And uh, <laughs> so yeah, food. I was always super drawn to it, and then. Like most of us, man, I needed a job, and I started scrubbing, started washing dishes, not cool. even thinking that I would start cooking. I just wanted to buy. Where was this? Where did you start? This is in a little beach town uh, called Mammoth Beach, so it was like a breakfast joint okay. called My Kitchen Witch Cafe. Okay. And my brother's best friend was a line cook there, and he got me the job, so I would just go in there super hungover and yeah, yeah. just scrub, and, you know, I just competitive person so yeah. i don't know i'd turn that into a bit of a competition like you know can you keep up yeah how organized can you make it the clean by yeah myself. i was just like <laughs> it's like getting this cheese off the plate so like, exactly and then yeah i started prepping i was like yeah I'm making these biscuits whatever and then you know junior year high school they're like so what college are you gonna go they just like try and force that shit on you I was yeah like, for sure oh. Who doesn't need SATs? Because I fell asleep for them, so yeah, didn't do too well on those. And uh, Johnson Wales didn't really require those. Exactly. So uh, I'm going to culinary school. That's the same reason I went. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's like I don't have to take this scheduled test. I was like, great. You I know, mean, I, I fell go. asleep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was like not that into it clearly. But, um, <laughs> so but yeah, I think prior to Johnson Wales, I worked at a couple of restaurants though. Did you um, visit the college before you went? Or did you just say, I'm going? I think I went for, no, I don't think I for went. Like an, for like yeah, a, yeah. might have. Uh, but and then, so, I didn't get, really have a choice. I was like, yeah, I, I hear you. Did go. your parents have a, a hand in you going to college? Or were they like, we don't care if you go, whatever? Uh, they were kind of on, like, you, you should yeah, go. Yeah, you should go. Yeah. yeah. Um, same thing with, you know, same they kind of forced that shit on you. I hear in, you. In high school yeah. and stuff. And now, luckily, it's like, yeah, not everyone's brain work, like, not no, everyone's brain. Yeah. Yeah, so we're finding that out now. Yeah, I saw an like, article the other day that was like, no homework, homework's bad. And I was like, where was this article when I was going to school? It's like you know the, I mean? was it the Bruce Lee quote? It's like, if you ask a goldfish to climb a tree, it's going to think it's stupid for its whole life. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know he said that, but all right. I'm always quoting the water one. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, so you go to Johnson and Wales, and uh, you lived in South Hall. I lived in East Hall. Yeah, that's when I first, you know, was seeing. Pat Bellanoid's in sleeping in that room right now. No way. Yeah, he's sleeping. You know what? I was just gonna ask you where that dude's at. He's, he... he's sleeping in uh, that room. All right. What is, what is he doing at <laughs> your house right now? He works at the Harbor House. Oh no way! Okay. I was, uh, <laughs> I was like, no. I was. Uh, at, one of my questions was, uh, you know, do you still keep up with any of your friends? Yeah, uh, yeah. I guess so. Yeah. So who else other than Pat? Anybody? Uh, that... Keith Garman. Wow, uh, he's the chef for the Boston Bruins. Okay, yeah. So, holy um, shit. Yeah, I mean Zappelli and Sean. Yeah, yeah. Zappelli, you know, the whole, the whole, yeah. the whole road. Zappelli's there. in uh, in Maryland, right? He's yeah. got his own. What, what's his restaurant called? I don't know the name of it. He's got he's starting an empire. So shout out to Tom, you yeah. monster. Tom Zappelli, monster. It's the Italian um, stallion right there. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the last time. Uh, I remember hanging out with him. You were there at his house at uh, when he lived on that hill. Yeah, it was like a one-way hill. Yeah, yeah, yeah just, for sure. Just drinking beers, chilling out. I remember 
drinking ton of beers before ice carving class. Yeah, was, exactly, exactly. We made the shittiest yeah. frog. Yeah. I'm always, I'm always <laughs> at, the, at the fucking party going, you know? For sure, for sure. So, you know, you get to Johnson & Wales, and at this point, do you know you want to be a chef for sure? Like, yeah, so um, prior to that, I worked at, you know, the nicest place uh, in my area, which is, you know, not saying much, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, it was a David Burke restaurant, and you know, I got my hands on the squeeze bottles and the micro greens. Got to and, do some yeah, gossip. I was busy and yeah, shit, yeah. so I was kind of feeling it. And then, um, yeah, I got to class and stuff. I was like, oh, cool, I'm, I'm, yeah. in. I'm in. Like this, it's this works. it's crazy how like not the food gets you first, the lifestyle gets yeah, you. Yeah, totally. It's like the staying up late, the meeting yeah. crazy ass motherfuckers. Yeah, I think I was just like. These people are fucking nuts. Yeah, and this exactly. is like I belong here. Yeah, <laughs> and they like me. Yeah, they're like, like I'm no, in. Yeah, nobody else like, has liked me ever. It's you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like so I don't yeah, fit in like, anywhere. Totally, I was like, I can like I can see myself doing this. I could yeah. not go to work nine to five uh, if I didn't care about it. You, I mean, my first trimester at Johnson and Wales was academics, and I had a one point eight. Oh god. Yeah. yeah. So that's where that like feels. if I don't care about it, you're not gonna I'm not gonna do it. Exactly. Um, no, I hear you, man. So like, same with high school. Just did not do well, but they're kinda like, just get the fuck and get out of here. Yeah, just do it. Yeah. Get them out of here, bare minimum. No you know, I had academics the first trimester too. And Failed I biology. Like, I can't. What's her name? Pfeiffer. 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 Yeah. yeah. She was hard, man. Yeah, dude. She was hard. She was supposed to do reports and stuff. It was, you know, like five page reports. I'm like, <laughs> no, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. The, you know, the weekend started on Thursday. So Amazing. already we were at a disadvantage for school. You know, like it, <laughs> their fault. Yeah, it's their fault. You know what I mean? Monday through Thursday. What do you want? Thursday, Thursdays. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, so you go to school and then did you work anywhere during school? Yeah, so what I do, um, Cook and Brown, which was, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I, I helped open up Cook and Brown, which kind of changed my life. But, you know, freshman, sophomore year, I was just partying a ton. Like, that was my, yeah. my focus. <laughs> yeah, dude. Partying. I mean, you know? that's all we cared about. I didn't yeah. even know what a real restaurant job was. All yeah. I knew was school, culinary. Um, and, you know, Cook and Brown was an institution. When when you first started working there, I was like, oh, he's working in the best restaurant in town. It was cool. Like, because at that time. It was not like other restaurants there where, you know, it was, the menu changed every day. And it was short, right? It was only, like, five small plates mm-hmm. and five entrees and three desserts. But it was, like, the first place where you're like, oh, this is actually coming from a small farm. Exactly. And it comes in every day. And we're tasting every single thing. And the chef is sending this back over and over until I make it right. And it kind of like just put the foundation down on what cooking could yeah, be. Yeah, like a high standard. Um, and like at the same time working there, I was doing weekends at, or some, I guess it would have been Friday, Saturday, um, at Cafe Nuovo. Remember this? Oh, yeah, I remember Cafe and, Nuovo. <laughs> and that was the complete opposite yeah. of that because they had the water fires. Yeah. And you do like 450, 500, and I was like, well, this is definitely not what I wanted to. Dude, water fire. Before all you people out there was like, you can't make a fire in water, guys. <laughs> it's an event they did every Saturday on uh, on the waterfront, and it's basically these torches in the middle of the river that they yeah. would light up. And just a grip like a of people would come. Yeah. yeah, it was crazy. Um, I had the one of the worst things ever in a restaurant happen to me there. What? Um, I was working cold side, and they had like all your nine pans were out, you know, on the bench in front of you. So there's like 27 of them and all the plates were above you. Oh. And I had a tiny chef coat on because there's no more. And I went to grab a plate and my elbow got caught in the sleeve. And at like five o'clock, right before opening, I dropped like a stack of plates or 29, Just nine pans. Smashed all over your mise en place. <laughs> yeah. You know, that happened to me at the track and I had no idea because you, you don't think about that until you do it. And they're like, oh, yeah, you have to throw all of that yeah, away now. No, everything. You got to restart. And you're like, what? And they're like, yeah, no, that's true. And you're like, oh, my God. Yeah, it was pretty, like, pretty. Like, the dude, the sous chef looked over. He's like, oh, dude, you just fucked up your whole night. Yeah, like, for sure. Yeah. You're just running around. <laughs> but it's like, it's those nights that, you know, I bet you that guy grabbed two other guys and were like, yo, let's all help him yeah. right now. Because if just not, not, yeah, it's fucked. This is not going to work. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's a good realization to have. Fuck. So, 
this happens to you and then where do you where do you go from there yeah so i worked at cooking brown after so i went to um did trimester in switzerland so that allowed me to graduate early okay so i kept working at cooking That's brown why. i was wondering i was like yeah. how is this guy excelling just crushing yeah i went to switzerland and did trimester there and uh, got no it's just like a, a it's called dct okay and it was like a culinary school and you just got to go there and it counted as a trimester gotcha. so you got to leave early okay very so cool. i just stayed at cook and brown for maybe two years year and a half and it was a really small team so I became sous chef and was basically like running the restaurant mm. and you know i was like 22 years old or something like that and i was like okay next step like yeah. i'm ready to take it to the next level so st- uh, he so the chef nemo bolin he worked uh, in boston for a long time and had connections up there so got me a stage at number nine park and then menton barber lunch restaurants yeah, yeah. um number nine really wasn't for me it was just kind of a little chaotic and i was just like really looking for something specific so yeah. menton was only open for like two years at that point and they were just like pushing and yeah. it was brand new every like it was just like I you couldn't I, say no to that place i had a i had a dinner there with um my girlfriend at the time's family and i knew you were working in the kitchen mm. but it was at that point where i was like so young i was like yeah. i ain't gonna fucking say that i know him <laughs> you know and probably on your end you're like i hope nobody comes in here that i know <laughs> you it know was, what i mean it was it was amazing yeah. honestly it was that's uh, very cool i remember i remember one thing they had these um corn medallins yeah served the on caviar there. and yeah. Corn fresh. Yeah. yeah that was that was fire so that was that was actually fun that was uh so that was a canopy i'm mm-hmm. guessing so yep. um i guess i was like the first person to work the canopy section there like the kind of like we we're still moving forward month by month like all right let, what's next and mm-hmm. it was just a i feel super fortunate to be in that restaurant at that time because everyone was just pushing each other yeah, it was sure. aggressive and you know people would want to get in fist fights and it was just like you know fighting each other for yeah. the for the perfect bunch of chives or like the good shallows for your brunoise and like that all the all that shit was like the most important thing ever yeah and it's like you fucking touch my chives i will kill you i mean that <laughs> that sort of competitive line cooking yeah. i feel like doesn't Especially happen in boston anymore. if you've never been to boston somebody will bite your fucking head yeah, off sure. hey fuck you motherfucker <laughs> you know i know how it is man it's it, the northeast that's a strong mentality it's yeah. because it's dark eight months like out of the, the year combination of uh, new jersey and boston was yeah. uh I had to learn how to be different when I moved to California. For sure. I mean, you know what? In those kitchens where you have to be that aggressive, where, you know, the other guys, they're not, maybe they're not out to fuck you, but they're definitely out to get the best bunch yeah. of parsley in house. Yeah. And you better be on that same wavelength. That makes you better. You know, regardless of anybody nowadays saying like, oh, well, that's a little negative or that's a little aggressive. At the oh, end of the day, like, it's like you're playing a sport which is like you're trying to be the best team in that yeah. sport, you know. Uh, so that's that's it was an amazing a, restaurant for so, sure. Yeah. Now, um, after you left there, did you uh, did you move up past the Canapé station there? Yeah, yeah. So I went Canapé to, you know, it was a proper brigade. So each section had their chef de partie, their sous chef, their entremet, and then their commis. Mm-hmm. So you start. Everyone started as commis, and then it's kind of. You know okay. where you go from there. So I went Comey to Canapé to Chef de Party, Garmage to Fish Entremet to Fish de Party, Chef de Party. Wow! So that that all happened you know, just under two years or something like that. And then, long story short, they wanted me to be sous chef, and I was like, No, it's not no, the time. I yeah. gotta learn some more Check shit. Mm-hmm. I gotta learn some more shit. And for me, I, what was missing was vegetables so i was just like i need to learn more about vegetables you know mm-hmm. we were kind of afterthought in this restaurant it For was sure. like a it was like a a child of 11 madison park and a french laundry or per se yeah and it was like all right luxury and truffles and caviar and you know the vegetable part of it was just an afterthought and i was like where am i gonna learn this so i wanted to travel wanted to go to a restaurant with uh you know big farm and things like that so i started looking what did you find when you started living? Dunkeld, so uh, the Royal Mail Hotel out in Australia. So okay. um, prior to that, though, somebody had gotten me. Um, actually, it was Hazel Wetmore. Okay. Yeah. Wow, she, Hazel Wetmore. No yeah. way. <laughs> Whoa. She, uh, you're bringing them back. Yeah, she got me the 
Attica, or I guess it's called Orig- Origin, but the Attica cookbook. Okay. And I was just like, what the fuck is this? I need to go here. So I emailed them every single day for like months. Not nothing. So I was emailing them, and then um, Ben Sukol of Birch told me about the Royal Mail. And I was like, actually, like, way intrigued in that. So, so at that time, you knew Ben Sukol. Mm hmm. I had no fucking clue that guy was <laughs> years after. No, yeah. where was he in all this? He was working for Matt Jennings, no? At this point, I think he had opened up the Dorrance. Okay, yeah, gotcha. So okay. Like, after, after. It's probably Dorrance pre-Birch. Okay. Yeah. Um, wow. It's a, it's a guess, so sorry if I fucked that up. No, I think it's probably problem. proper, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I was just talking to him about traveling and stuff, and he told me about the mail. So while emailing Attica like a psycho, um, <laughs> I started sending them. I know them. Ben Shurik too. He's the calmest, most gentle yeah, guy. He's so like, what is fucking want here? Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, so the mail was like, yeah, come out. I was like, cool, I'll just try this. And then, uh, you know, still kind of attack Attica. But some. <laughs> the fuck? You let people that's my alarm. Wake the fuck up. <laughs> Wake <All right>. up. <laughs> this time. You know, sometimes you take a nap. You know? <laughs> work is never done. Ever. All Ever. Right. Um, so, yeah, long story short, get accepted to the mail. Uh, if you don't know about this, this is like my introductory to remote restaurants. This is like four hours outside Melbourne in, okay. in the middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, the town is very similar to Elk. Probably the same population, which is like 250, uh, a post office, a general store. Yeah. And that's fucking it. And up until this point, you had been working in cities, you've been yeah. going to school in Providence, so you were not used to this. Yeah, I was taking the bus out there, and I was just like, am I on the right fucking bus? Like, this is, yeah. like, every time we pulled over for a stop, I was like, I hope this is not it. And then uh, <laughs> we finally get there, I'm like, this is fucking it. Yeah. <laughs> and there's just like, like imagine tumbleweeds like that's what's happening yeah um so uh worked there for a while dan hunter was the chef you would probably know him now of bray uh but massive gardens you know just kind of like that natural style of food um yeah it was, it was an amazing experience but four months into that he was uh he announced his his departure so okay so like i'm not I'm not gonna stay yeah. out here. How long? How long was he had be, he had been out there? Like seven years. Oh wow! So it was like a. So he was it like was an amazing kind restaurant. Of move. Yeah, okay. and like so, I, it was so boring that I started offering my week. Like we worked hard. Like we were. We started in the morning at seven, uh, picking everything for that day. So that was my first introduction to like, okay, pick it and hours is on the plate. And mm-hmm. I was like, well, there's no going back. There's from no this. Exactly. this is this is it. So um, basically, on my weekends though, we lived in. Um, this like cabin five like two and a half miles away from the restaurant down a dirt road no tv like nothing Mm -hmm. uh so i started to uh do these pop-ups with the next chef from there in the city in melbourne on my weekend just like work Mm -hmm. give me a couple like 100 bucks or something like that and i was like cool i get to see some other food and um you know get out of dunk health for the weekend uh and his partner in the pop-ups was a guy named peter gunn who was the sous chef at Attica. So, boom, I got my fucking Made in. Yeah, yeah, so did a couple of these pop-ups with Peter, and I was like, hey, I've been trying to get in. Like, can you get me in? And he got me into Attica. So that was, like, my whole goal. So basically, like, I flew with a one-way ticket to Australia, being like, I got to get into this fucking restaurant somehow. Yeah. And somehow got in. You got there, man. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. Do perseverance, yeah. you know? So you get to the Attica, and what's that like? like you meet Ben Shuri for the first time. He's so nice. He's the guy, nicest fucking so nice? chef, dude. No, he's yeah. amazing. So I think um, probably my first experience with like just a really nice chef. You yeah, know, like, for sure. You, you start there, you're you know you're like outside during service doing like marshmallows or something, yeah. like cleaning, cleaning carrots or just prepping and stuff. And I remember like my first couple of days there it was like raining outside. And I had, a, like, a fucking big raincoat on. I'm, like, scrubbing all the carrots from the garden. And he comes out with a, a coat on. I'm like, what's up, chef? You into the garden? He's like, nah, mate. I'm here to help you. And I'm like, middle of service in the downpour. He just, like, wanted to get to, like, know me. It's, like, crazy. <laughs> Dude, that's a, that's, a, that's a leader right there. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's somebody that... that but he would be in there at 7 in the morning knocking out... Um, 
what the hell was he making? Uh, club sandwiches for staff meal because he was bragging about how his club sandwich was the best. <laughs> he, he busted out. This guy busted out the electric knife to no cut the way. crust off. It was like all the bacon was grammed out. I was just like, what the fuck is going on? It's like so, club sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> Love that. Yeah, so that was that was amazing. Wow. When he came over and he did this dinner, um, it was Friends of Ben Shuri dinner. Uh, Jeff from Comey was there. We had a couple other people. But he had this dish. It was uh, yeasted potatoes and mint. Hmm. Just like potatoes, uh, new potatoes cooked for seven minutes in a bag. Yeah, just what like was literally it? No, I know just dish. cooked. No, I know this dish. And uh, like spring medium rare, yeast. he called it. Yeah, like medium rare be, potatoes. Yeah. yeah. So they had bite to them, but they yeah. were still a little cooked. And he just put them in this yeast butter, and then he covered them with all types of mint. And mm. it was like, still to this day, I'm like, how? <laughs> you know? Because I've tried to do it over and over again. And I'm like. Probably the type of potato. It was like this Virginia yeah. roast potato they use for the. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. Right, that's famous. But, uh, <laughs> something like something like this, right? Um, for the potato cooked in the earth, it was grown, mm-hmm. and it accepted you know moisture different than other potatoes. Exactly. So you could steam it covered in dirt, and it would cook like perfectly all the way through without Whoa. any variance. That's wild. So when you, uh, you know, you're there, you're, you're cleaning carrots, when did you move into the kitchen? Maybe like a couple weeks. Okay. So I had like, I ended up with like the best job there. So yeah, I cool. would like, it was almost like, I'm not going to call myself torn on, but like I ended up spending, so in Australia, when you get, when you work somewhere, you can only spend six months and he was kind enough to pay me. So thank you. Um, so I was getting paid and basically my visa only had six months left anyway. Yeah. So basically after a couple months, I was like, I would work starters. And then I would just follow the service through the kitchen. So I would just be like, so we're know, talking, end up on patient. Are we talking yeah. about one seating here? Two. Two so seats. we just like, you know, do all the, do all the snacks and the starters and then kind yeah. of just follow the push. So for like the way my mind works, that's like the best. Exactly. You know, yeah, I yeah. just like want to be in it the whole exactly. time. So, yeah. Uh, There's nothing worse than being on a station and you're like, oh, I'm going to get hit in half an hour. Yeah. And then it all comes in like 20 minutes and then you're like, ah, yeah. that's it. Um, so you worked there six months after that. You unfortunately you had to leave. Yeah. Um, what was that like? Kind of transitioning from there. Was so Ben there, sad to see go? Did he want you to stay? I don't. Know. No, I was just like I'm trying to remember. Well, Australia is fucking. It's cool, but it's fucking expensive there, man. Okay. Like, you can't even. Like I was like walking to and from work because you know staging and stuff. Like yeah, I was getting paid. But I was like sharing a room with someone and living in hostels, and I was just like, "All right, I'm on, I'm ready for the next thing." Yeah, so yeah, I was sure. just like pretty ready to go. Uh, well, there though, I met this guy named Jeff Downs, who had done the reunion thing already, um, and kind of like put me on to it. So I do a, I do a year in Australia. I get to work at these tube restaurants, like the vegetable thing. I'm like, I, okay, I, this is this is fucking awesome. Mm-hmm. Like this is the the standard now. Um, what's next fish why the hell am i gonna do that clearly you, you weren't gonna go to japan <laughs> for sure yeah so uh got to connect into japan so uh send some emails to Ryugen and to go to the branch in tokyo the three star they wanted me to go to hong kong first and stage for my stage and i'm like so you had to stage for a stage yeah Okay. I mean, I know it's hard to penetrate Japanese culture. Like, they yeah. do not let you do anything. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty... I mean, I was into it. Yeah, you know? yeah. Like, Hong Kong for a month. Uh, they're the two-star there. Where did you live in Hong Kong? They put you up. Oh, okay. So, the, oh, I don't know, not like... Bad. I mean, it's expensive restaurants, yeah, yeah, so I yeah. get where the money's come from. They, they, flew, they flew me there, and then flew me to Japan afterwards, and, like, put you up for housing the whole time. Damn. Yeah. It felt like a straight oh, baller. I was like... I'm rich. Oh, <laughs> they need me. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was just like, all right. I thought I was moving to Australia for four months. And uh, as the story goes on, you'll find out that wasn't the case. Yeah. But, you know what I mean? Like doing this whole like staging thing, you meet, it's not even about the restaurant or that chef. It's the the cooks you meet. Exactly. where you learn everything, yeah. man. Like the guy standing next to you is from wherever and he, he knows a better way to do this. And it's like, it's, it's the most important thing that you could do is For be sure. accepting to, you know, every day in your environment, who knows what, 
learning things, taking things in and not like, because there's a lot of people that do stars and they're just like, oh, I'm just here because it's the number two and they don't, they don't learn shit. Yeah. But if you were there to really take it in and appreciate not just like the restaurant, but the culture, it can completely change you. For sure. So. Wow, that's sad. You know, when you, when you hear the stages go out there and it's like, oh, it's, oh, all, it's, a it's just two. a name game. Yeah. It's just like, come on, man. And you like, know? I felt when I went out there, I was a decent cook. You know, I under I had good knife skills mm-hmm. and I understood heat and temperatures and, you know, I had a, a good foundation because you meet so many people that they, they can't fucking cook and mm-hmm. there's 15 stars on the resume, but they've never worked a section. They don't know how to organize it. And, you know, they're just kind of playing themselves. Yeah, I know I know what you're saying. Um, so how long was your time there? So uh, three months at Ryugan. Okay. Yeah, so gotcha. it was like... Was it the language barrier? Was that... Yeah, there's like no English. Yeah. So, um, you know, eventually... So the first week, two weeks, you stand in the corner and just don't fucking touch anything. Mm-hmm. And after the first week, most of like the Western people just don't come back. <laughs> so, because you didn't get to touch anything? Yeah. Okay. So you just do the dishes, stand in front of the fridge, move when it's time to move, and it's 14 hours a day and six days a week. And, yeah. You know, and then eventually someone hands you like a bunch of Mitsuba and they're like, cut this. And you cut it. You don't fuck it up. And then, like, that's your job for like a couple of days. Okay. And then you get another job and another job. And like by the end of it, I was doing like quite a bit of prep and. Yeah, I, like, learned a ton, and, like, my chef party, like, you know, he would, like, kick me and, like, get mad at me and shit, but, like, he respected me. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Because he was just giving me, like, by the end of it, I was doing, like, a lot of, like, most of his fucking work. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, like, was able to really take it in mm-hmm. and uh, under- try and understand and, like, show them respect, show him respect by, okay, I'm going to try and learn the name of my ingredients, and I'm going to learn what everything is called just so you know you don't have to try and tell me something so in english you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. So, um just be engaged anticipating his needs yeah and show know? up you know just show up with the comies in the morning and be there early and just just work my ass off yeah, yeah uh, every sure. single day so by the end of it he's like you should stay and i'm like it doesn't work like that like again the visa thing so yeah, being yeah, american yeah. if you don't know this you get you get 90 days um so the they wanted me to stay there and i was just like nope I can't. So, yeah. Um, uh, if you could have, would you? I have? I probably would have. Okay. I was like, I was pretty tired. Um, you know, yeah. living yeah, you're living in a, a, a tiny apartment with I yeah. think there was three other bunk beds and like it's like living in a frat house. Yeah. And at that point, you hadn't been back home in yeah, I don't in know a year. Yeah, over at a least, year, right? year and a half yeah. probably because I traveled in uh, prior to. Hong Kong, I traveled in Southeast Asia for a month or something like that. Okay. I almost died down there. That was pretty rad. How did you no. die? Well, I, I, got, I got a pneumonia and Thai stomach at the same time. What the f- Thai and, stomach? What is that? Oh, you know, this is like nah. the most legit version of food poisoning. Oh. Um, and I went to the doctor and they gave me the wrong drugs. Oh. So it was God. like extra epic. You had to go to the doctors in Thailand? Yeah. And then like, I had to, like I was like gonna die. Yeah. Um. So I got I, I had to like get myself to the hospital. I showed them the drugs they give me. They're like, oh fuck no, like hook me up and whatever. Yeah. But it was pre- I was just like, all right, I'm done with Thailand. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> little Thai stomach. Yeah. Get going your pneumonia. Way. It was like the Thai New Year. So yeah. like you, they like have parades and they just throw ice water at each other. So you're like getting, you're partying all day, staying up, whatever, and then like the covered in ice, ice water, water, and then like the sun goes down. It actually got like pretty cold, and then it was just like my body's just like you're done. Yeah, fuck you. Yeah, fuck man. I know how that is. So, so you yeah. finish your time there, and then what? You go back to the states? No, no, I went to to Belgium. Ah, now how'd yeah. you get that? Did you work that out while you were in Japan? Doing yeah, just this? like I was always looking for the next step okay. because I knew. Uh, I knew obviously like the the visa is gonna run out. What's yeah. next? And I was just like really looking for a restaurant where I could spend some time in, you know. Um, and I thought like this is actually the same guy Jeff Downs. Like, we became really good friends because we lived out the mail together in that cabin. And we're yeah. Just, like got super close. Um, he was out at Indowolf. Okay. So he's like, hey, we need people. Come on out. 
maybe you can get a, a visa or something like that. But um, so I flew out there from Tokyo and um, worked there for a couple months. And then, like, honestly, it wasn't really for me. Like a month in, I was like, uh, maybe I won't do this because, like, just the, the food wasn't for me. It was uh, there was not really much leadership in the kitchen, and we were like working like really fucking long days, mm-hmm. big push. And I was just like, come on. But how like, many how many covers were they doing? I mean, on the weekend, you do 40 for lunch, 40 for dinner, mm-hmm. and it was like 18, 19, like 20 courses or something. Jesus. So it was like, and it was like mostly stages. There was only a couple shift of parties, so it was okay. pretty unorganized. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, just like you just had basically after a while those places the stages sort of become the line cooks i, I was like running there. cold side yeah. as a stage like a month yeah in. and like and then like i started like working on the grill and i was like i'm basically a chef of the party yeah exactly. and I'm like, I'm yeah, like that for two I'm months <laughs> yeah, that's no, no, like, i was on a month in i was like hey like kobe like i you, you i need to get paid or i gotta go because i was like really pretty fucking poor at this point after japan yeah and, for like, sure and he was again he was super Super kind and gave me some money every week, and so I stayed. Cool, hell yeah! How was uh, working for him? He's a rock star. It was yeah. fun. Yeah, he's cool. He's he's wild, man. He's a he's a the fucking. Way he thinks, he's he's a like, fucking wild man. He's always yeah. moving. He's like yeah, he's always... like a, a true artist where you can give this guy the same same as applause and he can play it like thirty different ways. Yeah. And you're like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he did. Uh, and he's like during service, it's it's really fucking fun with him because he's like running. He doesn't want anything to do with the past. He's just running around cooking shit. And uh, that's that's for me. Awesome. Like I I've adopted some of that. Like I don't really want to stay on the past. Like I want to run around and cook and I be involved and, and be involved. And, yeah. yeah. So see, that's where I'm at now because you know I charge a rope mostly at the pass. Like that's what know, my once did. once dinner service hits, you're like you have to expedite. It stays on. I stood there and say yes or no to every single plate that went out and it's yeah. just like life it was like soul something. yeah after a while you're like horrible. i can't i can't do this anymore yeah, so. the good thing about uh charter oak is that there is times where you do go back and cook depending yeah. on who's in house or you know and uh you do have an opportunity to serve and talk to the yeah. guest which is is kind of cool um and then so you leave into Wolf, right? You get done with your time yeah. there. You go back to the States at this time? Yeah. Because okay. I'm like, it's been two years. You haven't seen your mom. It. You haven't seen your dad. You're like, yeah, like, in two years, I'm living out of suitcase. I don't have insurance. I have no money. I'm a fucking wreck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, man, you got to get your shit together. So um, back to the States. For yeah. sure. Um, now, did you go straight home and take a little time off? Or did you just go right back into work and- no, so I was like, we were having beers after the end of Wolf, and they're like, what are you going to do? And I was like, I think I'm going to go take over Saison. And everyone's like fucking laughing. I was like, all right. Yeah, <laughs> fuck you. Watch me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. So, yeah, I was emailing. I got I got a stage, um, so another one-way ticket to San Francisco. Cool. Did you have anybody to stay with when you came out here, or was it just like, eh, um, whatever? Yeah, no, I just came out here, yeah. Okay. So I was just like. Figuring it out. Yeah. You know. And then did you, uh, how many days of stage did it take you to get just, the job? Just two. Two? Yeah. Gotcha. Like, I was like, this better work. Let's... Yeah, exactly, because this is all I got. <laughs> yeah. So, it works out, you get the job, um, you know, how long after that do you have your own place? Are you... Just, I, that happened pretty quick. Okay. A couple weeks. Yeah, I lived out in uh, Portola, which is like, man, it's pretty far, not that far out, but, um, you know, when I first started there, I was making like no money. Yeah. It was like they were like way overstaffed and we were barely working and I was like, fuck dude, I don't know if this is gonna work. How many covers a night were you guys doing? Uh, early when I started there in two thousand fifteen it was pretty slow to be honest. It was like some nights would be like twenty two and then mm-hmm. you'd do like forty on the weekends. Yeah. It was it uh, always that fire cooking? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So always that's that's why I, so I should that's why I wanted to go there. So I was like, cool. You got I'm fish. Like, you had vegetables. Yeah, like, like I want to. I knew I wanted to cook with fire. Like, kind of early, early on, like Boston, early on. I was like, I was always kind of drawn to that. Yeah, and that's the reason I went to Into Wolf. Um, uh, Royal Mail kind of started this whole remote hotel thing for me. I was like, there's something here. Yeah. And then Into Wolf was this natural style of cooking, the fermentation, a lot of fire cooking, and again another small hotel remote. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and then I was like, alright, I want to, I want some refinement now. So uh, let's go to Saison where there's this fire element. When I got to Japan, I was like, well, this just fucking makes sense for me. Yeah. Uh, the simplicity, the, the cleanliness of the food, uh, the technique, and just like the purity of flavor. So I was like, okay, I'm, this is kind of my focus. Yeah. Um, so Saison, in from what you read, right? I've been there. It's kind of like mashing all these things up. The refinement, it's three stars. You know, it's fire cooking. There's, there's this, you know, this Japanese ethos involved in it. So I was like, well, that's that's where I want to work. So it was mm-hmm. Brooklyn Fair, or Saison. Okay. So you um, kind of had your two, and you were like, yeah. I'm gonna make this work. Now, did you stage at Brooklyn Fair at all? Or? No, no email back. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Hey, you missed out, all right? You <laughs> missed out. Your boy's out here, Michelin Stars, Book and Fair. What up? Matthew Cameron, you missed out. Um, <laughs> so you're at Saison and now Skeens. Is he there Is he there all the time? Do you see him? No. Nah, What's going on? Early on, um, no, nah, he wasn't really there. So who's the, who's the CDC? Who's the guy in the kitchen? Dude so it would have been, uh, there's two. So there was two. It's Scott Clark. So, shout out to Scott, Dad's Luncheonette down on Half Moon Bay. All right. Still best friends to this day. Thank and you. then on the other side was uh, Johnny Ortiz. Okay. Who has a shed project in New Mexico. All right. Uh, so, those are the two guys. And then a little bit after that, a couple months later, um, Chris Blydorn started to work there for a little bit. So, the bird song. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, you know... Did you move up the stations quick? Did you end up? Yeah, so on? everyone starts as a Comey, um, which was fine, and then um, so they introduced this uh, this like tasting counter next door. So it was like eight seats or something like that, big bucks, and um, you know it was just like Josh cooking, in, in theory. Mm-hmm. And so I was a Comey, and he was still calling me the kid with the glasses at this time. <laughs> <laughs> I love the three star. It's, it's like, okay. I got called the rapist for two years. I had these huge glasses. It's like, yeah. Like, so get the kid with glasses over here. So that was <laughs> like that was like my first introduction to Josh. It was like I was basically um, one of two other people that were in this little counter with him, cooking for eight people. It was like this massive menu, like luxury, like it's, it's kind of buffoonery. Yeah. Um, but during that those dinners the sous chef johnny hurt his knee so josh had to go back to saison so we stopped doing those and johnny was the uh, like, i guess you can call him like a saucier but um uh-huh. they called it like hot hot side sauce and so josh took that over and he brought me as his comey to help him so i was basically josh's comey mm-hmm. um which if you can imagine is it was pretty pretty intense mm, sure um, he's like here's everything yeah prep it yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what what uh, what time did your your day start there? What time uh, he let me come in whenever I want. Oh, <laughs> he was just like, is, when you're giving those keys, you're like, okay, I'll be here at six a.m. Uh, I was like, exactly. he's like, yeah, but he was like, okay, you gotta start bringing it back now. So yeah, every day he would like show up a little less, a little later, yeah, and like, yeah, yeah. and after a little while, it was just like kind of my station. So without even realizing it. That station is a sous chef station. Mm-hmm. So after like, I think only like a month and a half, I was working a sous chef station at Cezanne. Yeah. It was just like kind of got super just fortunate. Do it, yeah. Just fell right into it. And then like six months in, I became the sous chef. Very cool. So Very it was cool. like just just working super hard. And Did you, um, now at that point, you know, being sous chef at a place where, you know, Skeens is busy, he's got other restaurants, you're basically the chef. No, like yeah, well, chefs or- that early on, it was probably a, a year and a half before, like I was the, yeah, the chef for sure, for sure. So I was like, I was honestly not that into to the restaurant, and I was like, okay, like you know, there are some things that I, w- I wasn't really that into, and I was talking to Scott, and I was like, hey man, I might leave, and he's like, hey, just wait, yeah, because he he was gonna leave. He's like, you should wait. Yeah. So basically, uh, at that point, he was the chef, and. uh I took over for him. So I like kind of walked up to Josh at the one day before service. I was like, hey, I'm going to run your restaurant. And he's like, okay, it's going to get really hard. I was like, all right, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. It's going to get really hard. All right, cool. Done. Conversation. 
now you're the chef of a three star in fucking San Francisco. So where well, you were there when they had two. No, right. so like I, I had started like maybe a month after the, they got the, the third. third one. Yeah. Oh wow, okay. So at that point like the game So they were just like, like yeah, they were yeah. just like Stepping up their game. That's why I mean, sure. like when I started, they were way overstaffed, and I was like, "Ah, oh, this is like I'm not really yeah, doing yeah. that much." You know, I'm always happy to be a comi and learn new things, and you know, I love picking herbs. Actually, mm-hmm. it's like the zen and it's very you know, yeah, I really enjoy that stuff. Actually, um, but you know, I didn't want to do that forever, and exactly. luckily, I, I got. Like I called out as the kid with the glasses and pulled next door. Cause, you know, I'm working hard and things like that, and. You know, I guess it's easy to see that. For sure. Um, so, I got so, fortunate, yeah. Yeah, so you're running this kitchen, and uh, were there any challenges becoming manager? You know, because at some point you're a cook, and you're on the same level as everybody, yeah, and then yeah, you become a manager, and it's like, now i got to fucking listen to this guy. Yeah, you know I, mean? I mean, it's just, the turnover there's so high. Um, so it was, it's easy. It, was, it wasn't that bad, okay. because people... I mean, I've seen hundreds of people yeah. come in. And, and they just go. walk in and be like, okay, you're the C. They don't know any different. Yeah, like the no-show, no-call, no-show is a normal thing there. And, like, I think that was, like, a fortunate thing for me. Yeah. Now looking back on it. For because sure. in that restaurant, every day had the opportunity to be the worst fucking day. Um, whether it's, like, certain VIPs or, you know. It was every day was... The worst fucking day. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. The and worst like, fucking like day. Like I was just completely robotic. Like you could not hurt me. And yeah. I just like I hear you. you no know. soul. Yeah. I was just like You're just not, doing it. Yeah. It, was, it, yeah. it was fucking nothing mattered. Yeah. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you, man. Dude, sometimes you get in that mode and you're like, you you th- sit down and think about it. You're like, I, I gotta go. Yeah. Like, the like, fuck am my I My fucking doing? soul is being sucked out of me yeah. as we speak here. So when did you realize that? When did you say, you know, I got to get the fuck out of here? Probably probably during one of these uh, these Sonoma dinners. Okay. You know, I was, like, working, like, so you do these dinners, and it was, like, it's a guaranteed 24-hour day. I did one, and it was, like, a 42. Just didn't leave. Yeah. Just just open the restaurant get, up for the next day. Exactly. Just get, and I'm just kind of like... at four in the morning, you're like, let's do it. I just started prepping the next yeah. one. So you, as well. you drive all this shit to Sonoma and come back or whatever. So I was like, what am I doing here? So start. I started... I was spending time up here on my like one day off. I would drive up here just kind of like... Did relax. you have friends up here or no, did you just, just say, like, hey, yeah, I'm going to go just, up there and check it out? Just didn't even know it was here, right? Mm-hmm. I was just driving north like... Give me, Get out of here. Get me the fuck out of San Francisco. So, um, I just, like, started to get really drawn to it. So, uh, about, like, two and a half years in, I was like, okay, I want to harness. I started this book about, you know, this fictional place, what I wanted, and, you know, small inn, some remote, Mm -hmm. you know, under 10 rooms, 10 rooms, whatever. Grow food near the ocean. And I just started driving around the state. And uh, down in Santa Barbara, and then I went up to outside Portland, kind of check out that area up in Washington. But this area was always like number one, prominent. Yeah. 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 So, um, did you do any sea foraging then, or were you just kind of driving? No, I was just driving okay. and like immersing myself in yeah. in this place. Um, so, yeah, I was just spending some time up here, and then. Uh, Put my notice in. I was like, hey, you got to find someone else to do this. Like, yeah. He's like, all right, give me six months. And I was like, fuck it. <laughs> six months? Yeah. I was like, fuck it. Did you give that to him? Yeah. There you go. You know? Just, so, yeah, I actually, I had, I should backtrack. I found Harbor House and, you know, had an interview. It went fucking off. I, like, showed up with an iPad and the deck. I was like, hey, this is what's going to happen here. This is what we're going to do. And the owner, Edmund, was like, okay. Yeah. And I was like, oh. So they were looking for a chef. Yeah, it was closed for four years. What? And, like, they had to do a ton of work on it. It was, like, falling into the ocean. Um, they did a ton of work, and they were looking to reopen. And a friend of mine who actually ended up living up here was like, yo, they're looking for someone. So I just sent my resume. Had to, had the like, email back the next day. I mean, at that point, you got a badass resume. 
You know, yeah. you run around Attica, you got fucking Royal Mail, you got Menton, Attica, you know, Ryu, right? Ryujin? Ryujin? Ryujin. Yeah. Um, so, I had the interview in like a fucking Starbucks on, uh, what was it, 2nd Street in, in, uh, in Napa? In, no, in Soma. <laughs> like, I think like right before my shift at Saison. Okay. Okay. So, uh, presented the deck, went over it. You know, had a had a tour of the place. I walked in. And I just started fucking laughing. I was like, "Holy shit!" Like this is what's in my book. Yeah. I'm like it, this is what it. You had already talked about yeah. to yourself. So that's why, like, I was in this interview. I was like, "This is what's gonna happen." Because like, it wasn't like, "Oh, go see this hotel and then try and figure it out." It was like, I got there and I got right to work. And it wasn't like, "Oh, what should we do? Well, how should it feel?" I like, I just knew it all. Yeah. Um, because I had just been like kind of daydreaming and manifesting this shit for a while. So I tell Josh, like, hey, I'm going to go open this hotel. He's <laughs> like, let me see it. So I tell him the name. He's like, oh, it looks pretty nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they always <laughs> tell me this shit. I was like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, like, yeah it's all right. So he, he tries to get me to stay or whatever and like says all this stuff. And I was like, nah, man, I'm, I'm going to go. He's like, all right, you got to give me six months. I'm like, fucking shit, man. I'm like, Go back to the the owner of Harbor House. I'm like, hey, I need six months. And he, he was cool. He's like, all right, fine. So like after service at Saison, I was fucking driving up here and shit. Do some work, do some work in the morning, and drive back for prep. And that was just like pretty fucking intense. Yeah, for, for sure. For like man. six months, I yeah. was coming up here on my day off and like trying to meet potters, and I would just like go into the building and like sit. Yeah, and like be in it, it, be in the you space. Know, just yeah, like yeah. feel it and like, you know, like visualize yourself yeah. dreaming. So it's like move, just move tables around and like sleep in every room and see like what's fucking weird about this room and like because like I, I should like backtrack. I'm not just the the chef of Harbor House. I kind of have a hand in everything. So the the experience as a whole is kind of you know your brainchild. Your yeah, baby. it's like kind of the vision there. So yeah, because I was reading on the menu, you guys do uh, this the menu in the room. Yeah. Right. The in room menu. Mm-hmm. That's pretty cool. So that happens. How do you like, how do you work that out? Like you know, wh- do you walk into the room? Or are you laying the food out outside? Yeah. Like right now with COVID, we set a tray up outside and we place it down, take a couple steps back, and kind of walk them through it. Okay. Um, but usually you would walk in the room and you know set it up and. and okay. Walk oh, so you guys were doing this before COVID. Yeah. Okay. A little bit. Yeah. There you go. So, um, yeah, I mean like. There wasn't even grass at Harbor House when I got there. We spent three months, like, outside. I was buying, like, you know, like, rocks for the pathways and building garden beds Mm -hmm. and planting lawns. And, like, okay, then we have a month to move inside and buying, like, tissue boxes and toilet paper holders. Like, like, literally making it a place, buying rubs. And, like, now I'm a fucking designer. So. Um, really kind of like having a hand in everything, which I think has been really rewarding. Yeah, it's for like, sure, man. It's nice to not just do food. Exactly. You're yeah. literally curating the experience for yeah, the entire like, place. I like to cut the flowers and do like, you know, everything. Yeah. That, you know, it's, it's been pretty... Now, do you have anybody that you consult with for that? Or are you no, like, so I like, want this, this is the way it's going to be? Yeah, part of, part of my like contract was I need 100% creative vision. And I... I you're not going to tell me what to cook or what to do or, you know, and he signed off on it. Cool. It's pretty, pretty rare. So I feel super fortunate. Oh, what's his name? Edmund. Edmund. Yeah. So Edmund Jin. Yeah. So you were telling me a little bit of history about Harbor House. It's yeah. 1916. 1916, uh, built by the company that operated the mill in Elk. So they built it to kind of showcase what Redwood could look like as an interior design because it was only used for exterior building. So, not just did they walk you in and kind of show you the beauty of it, but it overlooked the entire operation. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of like a showmanship of their product, but also like used for a house of entertainment. Wow. That's crazy. So up until this point, how many do you have in your kitchen? Uh, during service, there's four of us. And then we have a position that we just made probably... A month or two ago, that's like call me during the day and then dishes at night. Okay. So that's been really, really fantastic uh, gotcha. addition because like 
we we understood like we didn't have a dishwasher for a while. Yeah, for sure. I mean, so, up in these areas, these rural it's so areas, hard. it's hard to find a dishwasher because so you don't hard. have a lot of immigrants. And then here. like you have a dishwasher, and they're you know they just don't show up. They don't give a shit. They're breaking all the plates. <laughs> yeah. and they're just not understanding. So we just didn't have one. Um, and I'm like, okay, if we can still execute and we can still operate without a dishwasher, let's hire someone that's gonna make the experience better, the food better. Instead of just washing a dishwasher, yeah, yeah, yeah so, for sure. You know, it's like two months ago I was doing all the dishes during service. I'd expedite, yeah. plate, run down, push some racks through, sanitize, and just that was service. Keep doing so it, I yeah. had like just two cooks and then me. We got really kind of like low staff for a bit there in for the beginning sure. of uh, summer, our busiest time. So it's just, it's always been like. Just figure it the fuck out. When did you feel Harbor House like kind of getting that that stride? And you're like, you know, your books are full every night. You're getting recognition. The accolades are coming in. I mean, I don't even know if I feel like we're there yet. Well, for sure, <laughs> yeah. no one ever is, right? You know what I mean, but um, meaning like, you know, you got your James Beer nomination. Yeah, yeah. You know, did that skyrocket everything? I think it happening? started so. Uh, the first person to come was uh, this writer from Food and Wine named Betsy Andrews. Okay. And she's just sitting there, and like three courses in, she's like, she calls me over. She goes, what the fuck? I was like, whoa. whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, are you okay? She's like, you can't eat like this in New York. And I was like, oh, like, like thank you. And she's like, I want to blow you up. And I was like, okay, like, huh, like sure. Yeah. I'm not really taking it serious. And then I guess she sent out some some messages or whatever. And then uh, Jordana Rothman, who selects the Food and Wine Best New Chefs, came. And I didn't even, like, put together. like. Yeah, you were just like, you are in your grind, man. All you cared about was the food. And, yeah, and, like, she came and she dined. And then, like, Food and Wine Best New Chef happened in two ni- 2019. And, like, that kind of, like, pushed it. That's something to do. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Now, how was, how was that process? You win Best New Chef. You, they fly you out, right? You go over there, yeah. and then you meet all the other best new chefs. Mm-hmm. Do you have to put out dishes at that point, or is it just like uh, photo so shoots? So it's and like photo shoots, and then uh, you do the, the Aspen thing. Okay, the Aspen Food and Wine event. Nightmare, yeah. <laughs> well, it's like I, I cook for 18 to 20 people a night, and I had to do 1,200 portions. If It does, does not calculate. What? Yeah. So. Uh. Uh, like grilling 1200 carrots by yourself is pretty chill. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So you're, you're telling me you're doing like a thousand cover tasting menus and then like eight to 20. No, it was just dinners? one course out in Aspen. Okay. One yeah, course. Okay. Yeah, so got you. Got you. At, at Harbor house, it's 18 to 20 covers. But oh, okay. Yeah, so I was like, God damn. <laughs> no, um, that was the nightmare. So then you come back from this James beer business and, um, you know, you go into this year, you get your star. Right. So now, how did that happen? Did you know at all that there was any Michelin inspectors coming in? No, man. I when I left San Francisco, I was like, never fucking again. Thank God. And then, like the next, like within six months, they're like, oh, we're going full California. And I was like, oh God. Like, I, yeah, Michelin's cool, right? It's important for the business, and uh, it made us real like way busier. Busy, right? yeah. So I have yeah. to appreciate Puts that. asses and seats. But, uh, That's right. It's not. Do you find yourself being like, okay, now we got this star, we got to keep it, we got to cook this way to keep it, or we're just going to do what we do, and whatever happens, happens? Yeah, I think it's a balance. Um, I don't want to just cook for the book. Uh, You know, there's definitely, if you pay attention, this is only my opinion, but there's a recipe there. Um, You know, if most restaurants, I feel, are serving the same things. You know, it's a caviar course. You got your wagyu, you got your truffles, and then you know, it's it, there's like a recipe, and I don't want to follow that. You know, you dine tonight, and there's not really any luxury ingredients. Exactly. You know, it's yeah. like I just want to continue on the rockfish and rutabagas path and serve food that, like real food. You know, I don't want to, yeah, do too much to it, and I want to stick to that. So I don't. So do you have goals of attaining more stars, or would you say that? you're kind of I think either here the second one would be nice yeah but um you know just again purely business wise I don't I don't understand Michelin I'm not gonna pretend I do I've had 
the most amazing meals in one stars and not good meals in three stars and two star I think is the most confusing category. I feel like two star is like the most high touch, you know, whether it's like the plating is a certain way and it needs to be looking like that. And then three star, they like relax on the plating and it's, I, I have no fucking idea. Yeah, I think I have like, nine or ten Michelin stars on my resume and I still have no idea and uh, so I, I think you can drive yourself crazy trying to figure out what it is so you know just talk to the team say you know we gotta just serve things that we're proud of and execute I don't know what will happen but it's not Are you... it's not my life goal okay I, I, I just want to have a busy that. restaurant so you know people forget that restaurants are a business yeah and, for uh, sure if we're busy, I can take better care of my staff. I can give, you know, I can give them uh, more freedom. We can close for a month and we can travel and, you know, we can be inspired and have a better culture. So, like, for me, getting a second star would allow us to do that because we'd be busy every day. Exactly. I can't forget that we're an elk and there's just no one around. There literally isn't. Dude, I, for, <laughs> I, for, I forgot to buy beers for the kitchen, so I'm like, all right, I'll just drive to this next town, Manchester. Hopefully they got a I fucking so you came liquor store. Here, right? I came. I, I was up here. I'm like, damn. I, I waited too long to like look for a place to get beers. So I was like, I gotta go to Manchester. Yeah. So I mean, like, it's just being busier and reinvesting into the into the cuisine and you know the service, whether it's you know plateware or just you know overall. I mean, back into your your staff and yeah. take care of these people that give you so much for and sure you can't do that without having a busy restaurant and being in a place like this you know, no one's gonna walk in off the street it's a commitment to get here so, yeah for sure uh, you have to convince people to do you have uh, a lot of people reaching out to work here do you have it's, it's picked up like in that? the last yeah. in the last probably six months it's definitely picked up have you um, hired from that pool or are you like i just been kind of going a little bit internally because people see it's look it's a pretty view it sounds cool it looks it's a different fucking thing yeah it's life is harder here I hear there's you. a lot of benefits yeah you live in this beautiful place and if you can organize your shit it takes you a couple months but then you forget all that stuff that you thought you needed so yeah. you know if you're if you're a 22 year old party animal it's probably not the place for yeah, you i hear you if you're grounded and you know what you want you can get a lot out of it yeah there's some people that you know come up to napa and from new york and then oh, yeah. you know two months in they'll be like oh, i miss new york and i'm like you had to know that this was not like that <laughs> like you had to know there's in the middle of nowhere. 200 people in elk. <laughs> that, that's wild. 98% of them are over 65. Oh, my goodness. Who knows, man? You might get a line cook out of that. Hey, push it. A little retiree. That's right. Um, so have you seen any changes in your mise en place and ingredients with the, with the seasonal changes? Meaning more so not just like from spring to summer, but, uh, you know, drought, a lot yeah, of rain. This... The menu, this is like a daily thing. Um, sourcing up here, there is no pick up the phone and call and deliver tomorrow. We don't, it doesn't exist. Yeah. So it's like, what can we get tomorrow? Like, I drove into the valley today, Anderson Valley, um, to get persimmons. And, you know, it's like, luckily there's nowhere to live up here. So the chefs live all up and down the coast so they can all stop at different farms on the yeah. way or stop at the harbor and pick up fish. Um you know, if it rains a little bit more, it's like, all right, run out in your backyard and pick mushrooms before serve, or before you come to work that day. So mm -hmm. it's like there's no central purveyor that, you know, we just pick up the phone. It's like, what can we get? And every day is like that. It's, it's pretty inconsistent, which is actually a blessing in disguise because it keeps you engaged. Yeah, you know, you sure. can get whatever you want whenever you want it. Uh I sort think of you kind moving. of yeah, you can kind of burn out that way. You know, it's like you don't you don't burn out from going too hard. You kind of burn out from going too slow. Yeah, you get you give yourself a chance to breathe. It's like oh, this is nice. You get a little <laughs> <stagnant. It's> like, <laughs> What's this? So when you when you um when did you first like want to forage for seaweeds and stuff? Was this always something you wanted? Oh yeah, to no, do? it was yeah. I mean, back at the Royal Mail, we would we would drive out to the the ocean and okay. like the the I guess it would be the south east coast of australia is literally this area it so, looks like it just broke off okay. and went down there it's all the same seaweeds there's eucalyptus everywhere the cliffs are the same it's like so, so it's sort of where you learned 
yeah, to do this. Yeah, it's like okay. same sea lettuce. Um, so for me, it just makes sense to, like, I don't know if you saw, but there's a path behind Harbor House that goes down to the beach. I like, did see that. Like, yeah. Right before you arrived for dinner, I was on the beach picking seaweeds. Mm-hmm. So it's like the one seaweed that was in the, the sea cucumber dish, it's only good for like five to ten minutes after being picked. And then it gets like hard as shit. Really? Yeah. So like you eat on the beach, it's soft. And like an hour later, it's like, oh, this is not even edible. Why does that happen? I have no idea. Is rigor? <laughs> I don't know. Rigor moles? <laughs> I don't that know. Might be crazy. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, like being so in touch with the ingredients here is like, like no other restaurant I've been to where you like, your finger is on the pulse. It's like, okay, we're doing this turn up thing or this cartoon thing this is kind of like that was like a, a light went off when we were doing this cartoon dish like early on and it like rained the next day it's like oh these aren't the same mm-hmm. <laughs> and now like everything we taste it and then we decide how to cook it every day so it's like the menu will change a little bit every day just depending on availability and you know what we want to do and, like when we first opened i was just changing everything every day and i yeah. just like wanted a little bit more consistency and, you know, to refine it a little bit, but that was like, it was pretty fun to cook like that, you know, just sure. straight off the cuff. And it, I st- it still happens for sure. Like we're, we're at lineup just before service and, you know, it's a new dish and it's like, I don't know, we'll figure, we'll see what happens mm-hmm. and I'll run it and don't worry about it. You know, it's like, I think you had a couple things tonight. You were like, what's that? And she's like, ah, because like sometimes I just don't tell them. I'm just yeah. cooking. I'm just cooking during yeah. service. Cook and have it. Yeah. Tonight I did it like this and tomorrow I might do it differently and, I don't want to lose that because it gets you out of bed in the morning, you know, having that freedom and going back to, you know, you cook for stars. It's like, you don't do that when you cook for stars because it has to be grammed out. Like we don't like great, like we don't use recipes. (laughs) There's no recipes. And it's like the recipe is the spoon vein with 25 spoons in it that we run through it every 10 minutes and we just taste, 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 Mm -hmm. taste abusively. And, there's, that's the recipe book, you know? Do you find yourself uh, sort of planning for a book at some point? Like a, like a cookbook? Like a cookbook, uh, yeah. Like there actually, people have already reached out because it, I guess it is a unique thing. Yeah, a yeah. unique place. It really so, is, man. Um, it really is. There was something that was kind of planned pre-COVID, and then obviously that just like hit the back burner. But mm-hmm. I think it's too early. For We're sure. still finding our bones. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, that's that's awesome to hear you say that because a lot of times people go, they'll find their success, they'll get their star, and they'll be like, okay, yeah, I'm good. You know, yeah. and, and to keep constantly going and say, we're not done yet. I just want to cook, man. Yeah, it's exactly, like, exactly. Just like, what are we doing today? I don't know. Let's, let's, uh, <laughs> I say it in the kitchen all the time. Go get all the best shit and let's make a menu. Yeah. It's like, those are the words. It's like, And like, when someone, one of the cooks volunteers like oh i know a mushroom guy and i'm like are you sure and like yeah i can get them and it's like i'm just on them it's like all right you're the fish guy like where's gary is gary diving for sea cucumbers call him call him yeah mushrooms this fish where's where's brian with the fish and it's like we're just working with these like solo people with one one guy on a boat and it's like what do you catch oh there's no one you like we can look out the kitchen and be like fuck it's pretty rough we're not gonna have fish for three days pivot we'll go veg heavy it's like you only had one meat course and like that's the only meat in the restaurant we don't make stocks and things yeah. like that it's like your meat sauce is kelp based it's like just vegetable heavy seafood heavy and when you have to pivot we pivot i thought the pickled egg was pretty goddamn tasty <laughs> Because I've been trying to do a pickled egg for a long time because I want it. So those are from August. You know. Yeah, so explain that. Just like. They're just like. The I mean, the egg is still. It's just like almost blanched mm-hmm. for two minutes, peeled. But obviously the yolk is soft. And then just. Uh, and just put in whatever in liquid like you want. Yeah, and just forget about it. Th- those are in a miso pickle. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You know, That's what I see. Like, little sauce underneath is like a uh, little mirin. Uh, Saikyo miso and dashi yeah to, to like balance a little bit very cool now are you getting your sort of ideas from restaurants you've worked at are you reading anything right now that's i don't read cookbooks okay um i think that there's like a foundation in like lightness and balance of japanese food that going back to like saison i wanted to i wasn't that into the food because 
for me it was just like coming from japan where i fell in love with the delicate like the delicate balance and like lightness of it for me like saison was like fifth gear only just like full-on seasoning aggressive Fire, like yeah. fuck like for me everything tasted the same because he, he does like the the saison sauce and it's yeah. like that is the premier seasoning for the entire menu and Again, this is just for me. People fucking love that restaurant, obviously. Like, people go crazy. It's a lot of people's favorite restaurant in the world. But for me, I think maybe just tasting. Like, so I would do the tasting every day at 345, taste every single thing. And, like, I was just, I, I didn't see, like, a balance throughout the menu. It was just, like, everything intense as it could be. Like, just full on. Like, my mouth would hurt after tasting every day. Mm -hmm. I would just get, like, sick. And I just wanted to, you know, change the way the menu worked. You know? Did so. you find any any um, kind of – did you feel any certain type of way while you were eating all that kind of food? Oh, I get super sick every yeah, day. Yeah, because, like, sometimes, you know, I – Every day I was just, like – and then on my day off at 345, I would get sick. Like, even uh, not being in the restaurant <laughs> – that's funny. Awesome. Like, I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> you know what? You, I've been getting a lot like of people coke. love the sea urchin toast. Yeah. Eat that every day for two years straight at the like, same no, time. That's good. good. That's funny. <laughs> I've been getting a lot of COVID tests recently. Yeah. So now it's getting to the point where my nose salivates when I'm going to get one. It just starts like getting the tingly feeling. And I'm like, dude, what the yeah, fuck, yeah. man? The body's like, smart. Yeah. It's that. And seeing people without a mask, you start looking like, what the fuck are you doing over there? That's awesome. So, um, is there any new things happening with Harbor House? What, what are you working on? What, what's in the future here? Yeah. Um, we got a pretty large ranch. Um, you know, like an actual. Like an actual ranch. Awesome. Three, How big? 320 acres. Damn. <laughs> like, a ranch, like a real ranch. You grow some corn, <laughs> fucking dude. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, so the whole idea is to just shrink shrink the footprint as yeah. much as we can. You know, there's the idea from day one, but <clears throat> it's there's it's just hard to get food here. You know, there's, there's, a, lot, there's a ton of farms, but, you know, fishermen just, you know, that you place an order and they're like, Hey, I didn't go fishing. Sorry, and you're like, "What the fuck?" Yeah, <laughs> I know what you're saying. Like, like, what do you mean? <laughs> people they say the artisans. When they yeah. say that, you're like, "Those uh, motherfuckers work when they want to work." Yeah. You know? So I think uh, just overall shrinking the footprint of where our food comes from, like really, you know, understanding the whole process. So we'll do a farm, um, and then on the other parcel, we'll raise the animals. Cool. What kind of animals are you looking to raise? So we'll do. We've been serving goat for a while, and like definitely goat, uh, ducks. Look a little bit of beef, but you know just a couple head mm -hmm. um, and lamb. Very cool. So maybe then like eventually a quail. So you, we can, you know, the meat portion of the, like you probably get two and a half ounces, sixty grams there, mm -hmm. um, and that's it's just a taste. You know, everything's aged in house, and you know I think you had some leg tonight. Mm -hmm. Are you aging in any certain way, or are you just hanging in the walking? Just like hung, go? yeah, just hung. Uh, we have the dehumidifiers in there, okay. some fans. So, I mean, those things pull out a ton of moisture. Yeah, for sure. So, they do. You know, depending on you know the time of year, the fat content, it's like picking fruit. So, mm -hmm. we'll go through the walk-in every day and be like, "Hey, this is ready. This isn't. This needs more time." And like when you're doing this every day, you like someone will send up a piece of meat or something. Like, Dude, this is like fucking two weeks old like what is this yeah uh so you you, you try to never get it. it's like I, I think that's literally happened like once or twice but like when you get used to a certain like texture and taste mm -hmm. you, you kind of like really start to appreciate that so you don't need a lot of that and there's always usually a vegetable component to the plate that's just as large as that yeah piece of meat so it's you know if we can raise animals then we only have two goats this month. Uh, we went pescatarian for a while. So it's like, I don't, meat is just kind of there. And it's like, you know, it's sustainable to raise goats and they do fire breaks. And, you know, it's like, they're just going to be a fully wild animals on 300 acres. So it's like, we're, there's going to be no intervention. Yeah. So it's, we're going to taste what the grass is doing. And, you know, is it a dry year? 
all these things. I think like the coolest piece of meat I've ever had up here was um, we got this cow just south of uh, Harbor House and it's like right on the bluff and we went to visit the whole herd and the rancher's like, this is a fucking hermaphrodite. And I was like, what the fuck what? are you talking about? She's like, yeah, it's born without reproductive organs. And I was like, she started telling you about it. So it, it couldn't be like milked or anything. So I was like, we'll take it. <laughs> and yeah. what happens there is all the fat for a grass-fed animal is stored in the animal. Nothing goes into the milk. So for a grass-fed animal, it had tons of fat. And it what? was June, so the grass was still green. And being on the bluff, all the salt is hitting the grass. So the meat is like pre-seasoned really fatty grass-fed beef and it's like well this is the par now just like everything else it's like if you hand me something that's the best version of it well we can't this is, we, we can't this go is, back yeah, this exactly. is now this is the drug this is the high this mm-hmm. is what we're chasing we're chasing the white dragon so it's like when a chef is like cool i'll do mushrooms i'm like are you sure yeah and no we just yeah it's actually we're just chasing that taste do you find that you have uh, any difficult diners up here I tend not to think so because if you're so far out, people that come here know I mean, what the to only, kind of expect. The only time we have an issue is if people don't know what they're getting themselves into. Yeah. We had a table tonight, no seafood, and it's like, what? <laughs> yeah, that's, that ain't right. No see, like They don't like seafood or vegetables. Like We have a meat-heavy menu, and it's like, no, because it doesn't exist. So yeah. we, we feed them the, the regular menu. And at the end of the day, this is not, you know, we, you know, it's like, oh, you didn't like it. And when you say, what about it? Or why didn't you like it? You know, it's not like, was something salty? Was something overcooked, undercooked? Was it tough? No, you just don't like seafood and vegetables. And this is a seafood and vegetable restaurant. So I think that's the only time. But I think people are usually pretty relaxed. They know what they're they're getting themselves into. For sure. You know, you're not just gonna walk in off the street because you can't. Doesn't exist. (laughs) You can't. If I can't, that's awesome. So, other than the ranch, is there anything else going on? Do you have any other plans? No, we'll just we'll do some housing. You'll do some housing out there for staff because it's so difficult. Yeah. Um, But most of them live in Anderson Valley. No, we're all up and down the coast from Fort Bragg to Point Arena. Okay. yeah, I mean, it's just like there's nothing out here. Yeah. So we'll try and get some uh, some houses built. So you're seeing yourself out here for the long haul? Yeah, no. I mean, for me, there's no better place to cook, you know. I think when someone's like, all a meal like this all the way out here, I'm like, no. No, you're, you're so wrong. It's like if it's like you just drove by your whole meal coming here. Like it's all it's all here. Mm-hmm. It's like the meal you had tonight. It's like. Like, if you're in a city, how many sea cucumbers are sitting on the subway as you go to the fucking yeah, restaurant? Not, not at all. It's like, you get to see a fucking... And it's wild, because I'm going to pass a goat on the fucking way. It's like, <laughs> no, all the food is here. It's like, there's a kelp. <laughs> like, it's like, it fucking makes sense. Like, you're so far away from where we should be regarding, like, food is grown here. It's like, it's natural here. And it's like, yeah, we're serving it here. It doesn't even have to go anywhere. Where in... You're in a city. It's like the food is coming from all over the fucking world. Yeah. It's coming from all the country. It's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> That's unnatural. Everything is here. We just brought it 10 we minutes. Just cook it, yeah. We walked down to the beach and fucking brought it back and put it on a plate. Yeah. It's like that's the disconnect is so fucking far away where people can't understand that. What do you mean a meal here? It's No, it's all here. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's crazy. It's like the the misinformation and maleducation of a lot of people that don't work in restaurants or haven't ever worked at restaurants is like people insane. think that nice restaurants belong in new york it's exactly like, is that that's the fuck it's a there's no nature there <laughs> exactly <laughs> where are the farms yeah and you you know a lot of guys that i know over there they're like yeah all the farms are in new jersey so it's like oh so what the fuck it's like oh, you know like you can taste the fucking back of the truck. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, <laughs> I like, hear you. <laughs> the metal walls. Yeah, of the truck. it's like <laughs> you can fucking see it. Yeah, and you know I'm not taking anything away from you know New York restaurants or that no, it's that just farm different. scene. It's just different. Yeah, yeah but this is the purest of the pure. Like, where are you getting your abalones? 
those, those, so, I mean, man, if you walk down on the beach, there's thousands of them, but if you don't know this, there's a, I guess it's now eight years, but there's a 10 year ban on. Yeah. Family. Yeah. Yeah. So those so are, you, you those are Monterey. So gotcha. what, what we'll do is we'll get them from Monterey and then the chefs will go down to the beach every day, bring back five gallons of water and we'll store any live shellfish or seafood. In uh, that water. it's fin fish, crabs in that water. So it gives us the taste of this place. Okay. Got you. So even if you can't get it from here, you're still making sure. We're doing that our you're best to, you know, your... and like the abalones are way happy. Like, yeah, you know, for sure. So other we're restaurants, going Monterey Abalone Company? Yeah, I mean, like, like other restaurants, they have tanks, but it's like this reverse osmosis water. So it actually has nothing to do with the ocean. All those minerals are gone. So when you put them back in this water and introduce like a bubbler system where it's turbulent and it's like the intertidal zone, they're just far happier. Yeah. And I think like they're, they end up being way softer. Cool. What, uh, what projects do you have going on in your larder? Cause I know that you have a, you have a guy. <laughs> Kyle? <laughs> yeah. He came over and started the restaurant. Yeah. He's like, Kyle doing all sorts of wild shit. Yeah. Um, I don't know, like misos and yeah. you know. Do you guys have a room for that, or we you... got like this chamber? Like we were growing all our own mushrooms for a while. Okay, um, how does that work? You can like we tent it off an area, and you introduce lights and a humidifier, and if you just get the blocks, mm-hmm. they'll, you can have. You, we were just supporting all our own mushrooms. Okay, so how long did it take? I mean, like, once you start getting the room going and it's, like, inoculated, you can get mushrooms, like, every three days. Really? Yeah, like, shiitakes, we, you could just pump. So we oh. were doing shiitakes, oysters, and um, we were trying trumpets. Mm-hmm. But shiitakes worked the best, and that person left. Um, but, like, that's kind of the thing at the restaurant. It's like, we can do anything we want. But don't forget, someone has to do it. Exactly. You know, it's like everyone has a great idea until like two weeks later, you're like, oh, that was a lot of work. Mm-hmm. Um, I was like, well, you want to grow mushrooms? I'll, I'll get you what you want to support this project. But be, com- be committed yeah. and take it serious. And, uh, you yeah, know, we can do anything. It's like, you know, there's all sorts of ideas of, you know, getting different traps and keeping things in the cove alive and this and that. It's like we have this amazing property. It's like, yeah, you want to. You want to plant whatever you want? Let's go. But you have to water it in the summer, and you have to you have to plant things, and you know make sure that you're keeping up with it. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's easy to have an idea about doing cool shit, but are you really gonna own that? And I think like I'm fortunate right now to have a team of people that are fully invested. For sure. You yeah. know they're working. You know they're running around on their in their mornings or on their day off to get fish at the harbor or whatever it may be. So that's very commendable. Yeah, I mean, I feel. When you have people, shout out to the team. I appreciate you. I appreciate everything you do. Thank you. There you go, Maddie Cam. (laughs) Appreciating the team. Um, Well, Maddie, thank you very much for this. I appreciate it. Um, This is not going to be the last time I talk to you because I'm sure that you're going to be coming up with some cool ass shit over the next uh, couple months. Plus, I also have to go stay at the hotel, actually, because I need that breakfast. (laughs) I've been hearing so much about that breakfast that I'm like, I need to go there. It's packed. Because I know I'm literally going to go back and be like, yeah, I went to Harbor House. And like, did you stay? And then people are going to just consider me a failure because I didn't stay. So, but that's okay. Because we got this podcast done. You guys got to know Maddie Cam a little bit. I got to know him a little bit more. Um, the last time I spent time with you like this, we were eating a foie gras dinner at Gracie's. Whoa. You remember that? Yeah, that was That's disgusting. Right. Tom Zappelli could amazing. make it. So yeah. he was like, go to this Alternate, foie gras dinner. Yeah. We were like, like, all right, <laughs> cool. Remember that? Fucking Maddie. Maddie I think it's probably the last time, more time I ate foie. <laughs> probably, yeah, because in California you can't eat it. Yeah. Although you can import it. You can buy it now, but you can't, you Wait, can't, uh, I don't know. Sir, man, Every, sure. everything's weird now, but anyways, uh, so yeah, I want to thank you, sir. And, um, if you want to plug anybody and you want to shout out anybody, go ahead. Just plug the, the Harbor house staff. Thank you for showing up every day and being committed and, you know, following the dream. So thank you. We wouldn't Very be cool. here without you. Awesome. man. So check it out. Harbor house in chef, Maddie Kammer, uh, one star chef. And before we go, you just recently got this environmental kind mm-hmm. of award from yeah. Michelin. How how did that all work out? 
Uh, they just, I think they sent like a g- generic email out. Um, and there's like, what do you do? I just kind of like told them. And they, they call you and start kind of interviewing you. And then, uh, I don't know, it just, it just happened. So, I mean, like, I don't, we take it pretty serious. Um, For sure. With like what we're doing and, you know, what our future is. And you know, it's definitely the reason that, you know, we don't serve certain things from yeah. across the world. It's like. You know, you're, you're not going to see the Hokkaido Uni or something like that. It's like, you know, what's here and, you know, let's try and do something special with it and be conscious of what what we're serving and where it's from and, you know, what kind of impacts that has on, on the environment. So I think uh, it worked out. But, oh, yeah, bro. But a couple miles to go, every, every restaurant does. So The work is never done, guys. It should be uh, the forefront of all of us. So. Fuck yeah. All right. Well, Sucio Talk signing off. Episode three. Maddie Cam. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Am. 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 Thank you, sir.